Horizon and Chance One Lucy reaction and this is why only one gram of this material is worth twenty five billion dollars. Damn. What the hell is that going to be? This is by the channel Real Life Lore. Uh, only one gram is worth twenty five billion dollars. This is gonna be some material. No material is that costly. I don't know. So yeah, this is real life lore video. It might get blocks out to put check it box there, but I guess we'll see. I've reacted to quite a few real life lore videos already. If you haven't seen them, check out the cards. There's a playlist created for it. Real life lore reaction, something like that. Check out the playlist too, like you know, CGP Grey, um, Kuz Gazat, Internet Student, Samuel, things like that. And yeah, let's watch this one. This real life lore video is made possible by Skillshare, home to over 15,000 classes that could teach you a new life skill. The first 500 people to sign up using the link in the description will get a two month free trial. So commonly when we think of the most valuable material in the world, our minds tend to center onto gold. And while gold is very expensive at a current value of $56 per gram, there are other materials that are significantly more expensive. Drugs like heroin, cocaine, and LSD, for example, are the most expensive drugs in the world by <laughs> He just read ballistic there. 200 per gram heroin, 300 per gram cocaine, $3,000 per gram for LSD. Why is LSD so expensive? Damn. That's why LSD is more club drug, isn't it? Heroin, cocaine, people can just buy from some corners. <laughs> but LSD, you have to go to club and pay real money. High enough money. Damn, 3,000 per gram. Sheer weight far more valuable than gold is. The market value for diamonds per gram is even more prohibitively expensive. But even this is nothing compared to the most valuable material currently known to humanity, antimatter. So uh. what even is antimatter? <laughs> To put it simply, antimatter is the opposite of regular matter. Down yeah. at the atomic level, antimatter is made up of particles and atoms just like regular matter is. The only difference is that they have an opposite electric charge. Protons in antimatter are negative and called antiprotons, while electrons are positive and called positrons. Whenever antimatter and matter touch one another, they instantly annihilate each other in a 100% efficient yeah. release of energy. Yeah, antimatter, basically every matter uh, has antimatter, obviously, at the start of the universe, when the universe was really hot, every particle that was created, there was an antimatter for it, like he said, you know, positron, things like that. Neutron also has antimatter. Now you will think, like, why would neutron have an antimatter? Neutron has no charge. But the quarks that makes the neutron, those quarks have some marginal, you know, energy in it. Uh, you know, both energy cancel each other's out, but anti-neutron would have opposite of that in the antimatter way. So there's antimatter and neutron too. So basically, these are the you know particles that you know uh, eventually find each other and you know annihilate each other. And only energy in the in the in the sense of photon is left. So basically, at the start of the universe, every matter had antimatter. They destroyed each other. But the point is, the universe was cooling down. All right. So basically, when the universe cools down, uh, the universe cannot make you know matter antimatter like that. So you know the the issue was that if a universe cools down so much, and if you know matter antimatter eventually finds each other and destroy each other, then there would be nothing left. It would be just you know uh, photons and energy, just light, nothing there. But what happened was. Uh, one in a million uh, particles that were created, one of them had no antimatter, which is all of us and everything that we can see and we, there is to uh, in, in, in the world. So basically, what we are is an anomaly, one in a million, because every other uh, particle had antimatter and could destroy each other. And yeah, antimatter basically destroys and like he's a hundred percent pure energy. It releases hundred percent pure energy. So that is a great source to create maximum amount of energy, even more than I guess nuclear fusion, because that doesn't create hundred percent energy. I guess it's just only few percent, depending. So yeah. This pure energy release is why antimatter could prove to be extremely useful. The most efficient nuclear weapons, for example, convert a mere 7 to 10% yeah, of their only. mass into energy, while antimatter to matter collisions release 100% of their mass into energy. Yeah, I think Hiroshima bomb only uh, used uh, 3 or 4% at the time. I'm not so sure. I read it somewhere. I think it was 3 or 4%, but nowadays it's 7 to 10% efficiency. 
If you somehow were carrying one gram of antimatter about the size of a raisin and dropped it on the ground, it would create an explosion greater than both the Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear explosions combined, Damn. easily enough to destroy an entire city. Smaller scale assassination weapons may be more economically feasible, however, like the theorized antimatter bullet, which would essentially be a regular bullet but with a tiny one billionth of a gram of positrons attached to the tip. Upon impact, the bullet fired from a rifle would be capable of destroying an entire house, tank, or any other similar sized object. But oh, so that's how, you know, Fallout 4's prefix works. There's an explosive prefix that weapons have. This is how they have antimatter in it. Okay, I understand. <laughs> antimatter has several other uses beyond just military ones. Antiprotons have also been shown in several studies to have the potential to treat certain kinds of cancers. And antimatter could also be used as a fuel source. How? through radiation because I'm pretty sure there's a massive amount of gamma radiation antimatter produces when they collide with the normal matter. For interstellar travel, it is conceivable that using antimatter as a fuel source could propel a rocket with humans on board to yeah. about 50% of the speed of light, which is fast enough to reach the nearest star to Earth two in years. just a little over two years. Damn. So why have- Damn, really? Just two years at 50% of light? That is extremely low. I thought it would be a few years as in, you don't know, nine ten years at least but two years that is fast yeah so basically obviously you know like like the video said you know matter antimatter when it collides it creates 100 percent of the energy so it's a great energy source so you could use that as fuel too but uh, you know matter antimatter when it collides it creates massive amount of gamma radiation too and that's really deadly so you'd have to come around you know make some kind of a make something that would prevent gamma radiation to you know reaching all the people on the ship because gamma radiation would screw everything up every people up on the ship so that's uh, this is way in the future extremely way in the future we created enough antimatter yet to do any of these incredible things the answer is because antimatter is incredibly rare, difficult to produce, and prohibitively expensive currently. It appears that nearly the entire observable universe is made out of regular matter. Obviously. And while it is possible that there could be entire galaxies made out of antimatter, we have so far not been able to detect any. Antimatter is produced. Antimatter galaxies can't exist because, you know, they would eventually find normal matter and explode. So, you know, uh, the, the laws of physics tells us that as the universe cooled down, before it was extremely hot, as the universe cooled down, when it was cooling down, by that point, you know, any antimatter would have found the normal matter and would have exploded and created an energy and photons. So, antimatter universe, as far as our understanding right now, can't exist produced naturally in Earth's outer atmosphere when high-energy cosmic rays impact it. But the amount produced is tiny and lasts only briefly before it comes into contact with regular matter and annihilates itself. The only practical means of acquiring antimatter so far have been Sun. to produce it artificially ourselves. But even this method is incredibly difficult and expensive. The Large Hadron Collider, operated by CERN in Switzerland for example, one of the most expensive and complicated facilities ever built, is capable of producing 10 million antiprotons per minute when fully operational. That sounds like a lot, but it's actually a laughably tiny amount. To produce just a single gram of antimatter at that rate of production, billion. it would take CERN roughly 100 billion years to complete. Production is only the first problem though. Storing it is perhaps an even larger problem. Since antimatter annihilates matter instantly, you can't just store it in a regular container. Yeah. You have to suspend the material without it coming into contact with anything. And so... Yeah, obviously antimatter, everything that we can f see, touch or whatever, everything in the universe is matter. So you can't just create antimatter and put inside anything because that would have been matter and that would, you know, could create explosions. So basically you have to, you know, use a magnetic field. That's how, you know, I think somebody did experiment a long time ago. They did that, but you know, it didn't last long, something like that. So you would, you'd have to use magnetic fields to do that. 
far, CERN has only succeeded in storing antimatter atoms for a record 17 minutes yeah, before they Sun became annihilated. Since just one gram is enough to obliterate an entire city, safety precautions in storing the material and keeping it in safe hands would be of the utmost importance. And we're not even sure how exactly we would store such a large amount in the first place. Estimates on how much antimatter costs to produce varies greatly. In an article written by NASA Goddard in 2006, a figure of $25 billion per gram is cited, while in another NASA paper written back in 1999, a figure of $62.5 trillion per gram. 62.5 trillion? You know what? Uh, he said it would take billions of years to make, so to me this 62 million trillion one makes more sense than the billion one. Because if only one gram would take that many years just to create, during that time the process and yeah it would take trillions definitely 25 billion feels very less for all that time so this feels more plausible gram is cited which is about 83 percent of the entire global gdp just to produce one single gram for reference, the Manhattan Project, which developed the there first atomic bomb, cost $23 billion adjusted for inflation. And just like creating the atomic bomb did, creating antimatter in large quantities, if ever that's possible, would open up a new Pandora's box that we couldn't close once we open it. We would have to live with the consequences of life in a world with abundant antimatter. Yeah, there's so many things when science advances, the, the discoveries it would do would open Pandora's box but yeah I mean you can't stop science and advancement of technology it's gonna happen both positive ones and negative ones in the meantime though if you want to watch something yeah. positive and learn something new right now yeah people go to skillset.com for slash rll5 yeah and support this channel yeah, so he was talking about antimatter. This is the, I was like, what the hell could cost $25 billion? But yeah, it makes sense, antimatter. Obviously, it's ridiculously hard to create. But $200 billion, I think that's what he said, right? $200 billion years it would take. Where is it? There you go. Now, $100 billion years. One gram of antimatter creating would require $100 billion years. So yeah, if it's in trillions, that would make sense. Because $100 billion years, it would take trillions. Definitely, if not more. Yeah, this is just, yeah, you need to create an immensely massive, massive particle accelerator to, you know, accelerate all these things. The sun is, you know, big, but not big enough to do lots of experiment. Uh, basically, string theories are coming up with lots of solution, but those are just, you know, they're just saying things. I mean, you can't test it. And one thing Brian Greene says this a lot of time, like, only reason is that because we don't have a means to experiment because we would need an extremely big particle accelerator. So when the time comes where we dominate space and we could create a massive particle accelerator like on the moon or something with the diameter of moon or something, things like that would, you know, advance things like this a lot faster. So this is in the future, but it's something. And antimatter and matter when it collides creates 100% energy. So that's a great fuel source to go to next star. Obviously, like he said, just two years. That's nothing. So we could go to Proxima B in just two years. That is awesome. All right, people, if you like my Rick Sando for like and subscribe, check out the Rick Sando. There's a link in the description. Check out the castle of the place. Check out the end cards. And yeah, I'll see you next time.